Today on CityCast Portland, we're talking about the district attorney's race heating up, the skyscraper that may or may not be built in Old Town, and outdoor dining is here to stay. Joining me today on this week's News Roundup are Oregonian Courts reporter Zane Sparling and our very own audio producer, Julia Fiaioni. It's Friday, September 1st. I'm John Natariani, in for Claudia Meza, and this is what Portland's talking about. Julia, Zane, welcome to CityCast. Welcome to the Roundup. Thank you. Hello, hello. So, Zane, this is your first time on the show. Glad to have you here. Uh, We usually get started with a question to sort of feel out who is on the show today, get us loosened up, get us thinking about the things that are really important in Portland. And the thing that I wanted to ask the two of you about is about city council. Mm -hmm. We've been starting to hear a number of people declaring that they're going to put their hat in the ring and try and join our city council. And I'm thinking that this is an opportunity for us to really uh, change the level of representation. There's going to be more members. We can have more different types of people on city council. So I want to ask both of you, which Portland stereotype do you think needs to have representation on city council when the election comes around next year? (laughs) Um, I'll go first. I was out on Sandy last week and I saw a couple of the like tried and true tall bike clowns just sort of rolling down the street. And I think we need a tall bike clown on city council. I feel like their voice has really been diminished Mm. in city policy in recent years. I think from their vantage on a tall bike, they have a view of the city that the rest of us don't. And they could just bring some levity to city council meetings. So I'm campaigning for a tall bike clown on city council. Oh, my gosh. Uh... (laughs) (laughs) You set the bar high with that one. Literally. (laughs) Oh, (laughs) thanks. (laughs) I think the first thing that comes to mind is I'd love to see some um, Portland skaters running, you know, some of our shredders, our skateboarders downtown. It seems like they have a real vision for the city. Exactly. Who knows city infrastructure better than a skater? Exactly. And they're really like focused on setting a good community vibe. So I'm going to run with that. Absolutely. What about you, Zane? (laughs) I'm going to say that I want a a group ticket for the people who shop only at Cabela's but have never touched a gun, um, wear only Carhartt, but it's like dry clean. Like it's just it's pristine. (laughs) They've never seen a wrench. And maybe also that dude who's got all his keys on like a carabiner, but he doesn't Uh work as a janitor in the 1960s. Mm -hmm. I think it's almost inevitable that we're going to get one of those guys on city council. I think just by (laughs) demographics alone, (laughs) there's enough of those guys out there. And I also see like the sort of guys that would be like, yeah, I've never done politics before, but I can I could do city council. How hard could that be? That'd be great. Yeah. (laughs) It's going to be such a wacky election. (laughs) I have no idea how these new rules are going to shake out. Yeah. So true. Well, thanks for playing, you guys. I think since you're our guest, Zane, we'll (laughs) let you go first, uh, talking about stories of the week. What are are you looking at? What have you got your eye on this week? Yeah, so I'm a reporter at The Oregonian, Oregon Live. I cover the circuit courthouse uh, for the newspaper and our website. Uh, I think this week we're paying a lot of attention, um, even in the early days, Uh, to a different election, the election for the Multnomah County District Attorney. It's going to be a nonpartisan countywide election. Already we have basically our two candidates established. It's the incumbent, uh, District Attorney Mike Schmidt, and one of his own employees, Nathan Vasquez. Yeah. um, Mm -hmm. Interesting race. I mean, (laughs) Julia, if if you were ever to campaign for my job... (laughs) I w- <laughs> I'd be feeling a certain way about it. <laughs> See, that's my initial question. Is that typical in Portland, or at least for this race, for that to happen? It's not that typical. Um, the DA's office has been run by unchallenged incumbents for a long time. Mike Schmidt actually did have mm-hmm. a challenger where he very easily slotted into the role of the progressive reformer. And the other candidate, I think Ethan Knight, uh, was the tried and true law and order candidate. And those roles aren't really going to change. Uh, Mike is still going to be running as the reformer, except now he's in office, so he's responsible for everything that's happened mm-hmm. since 2020. Mm-hmm. Whereas uh, Nathan Vasquez, who is, of course, has been at the DA's office since 2001, is not running as an outsider, but is running as the law and order candidate. I mean, that's the lane he's going to occupy. And he'll be relatively to Mike's right. I mean, he's not running as a Republican. It's a nonpartisan race. But 
uh, he, he's certainly going to be going going a little bit more towards the center than, than Mike was and his supporters were. Mm-hmm. It's just it's just such an interesting shift because, you know, when Schmidt came in, he was all about being the most progressive DA. And it was at this era where that was a, a thing that people really wanted. You know, we were talking about criminal justice reform. Um, we were talking about sort of over policing, over incarceration, and just the public sentiment has shifted so much in, you know, the what, three years since Schmidt first came into office? You know, and I, I think my question, and I'm, I'm curious what you guys think, is is this just going to be a vibes election? Is this going to be an election <laughs> mm-hmm. about strategy? Or is this going to be an election about what people perceive crime to be? Yeah. The same thing with what we saw with the city council race was kind of a vibes election in a certain way, you know, between Joanne Hardesty and Gonzalez. Looking at this story from your uh, colleague, Noel Crombie, and Schmidt's campaign director said that, While Schmidt doesn't have downtown developers handing him rent-free office buildings, he does have a community-wide base of support with more individual contributors than his opponent. (laughs) Which means he's taking a shot at a city council member that isn't even in the race in like the initial warm-up to his election. (laughs) Which, if (laughs) you don't remember, Rene Gonzalez, when he was elected, he got very like sort of heavily dinged for getting this... uh, either completely subsidized or like free office building downtown. Mm. Which raises the question of what are people doing in a candidate office? I mean, is it like a a row of rotary telephones and they're all going off? That's what I was wondering. (laughs) It's a great (laughs) question. Like, do they really need that space? What do they usually use it for? Mm, I I remember seeing a you know, storefronts and they would just be plastered with campaign sites so you couldn't even see what was going on. In there, and I don't know if that was for Renee's race or someone else's, but it it made you think that there it's just an empty building. Speaking of which, did y'all see the billboard that went up again? Because White Claw Summer is over. Oh no way! Oh wait, 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 wait! The the, the Schmidt Show billboard is back. Schmidt Show's back. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> oh no! <laughs> it's so funny because I think the official coining of that phrase came from at the time Portland Monthly reporter Julia Silverman who actually wrote a cover story that was called Schmidt Show. Uh, I don't think we need to explain that joke about Mike Schmidt and saying that he kind of has this sort of uh, looming fear of becoming Chessa Bodin, right? The San Francisco DA who was also a progressive reformer and yep. just got mm-hmm. kicked out. Uh, now it's been a little while, but in the in recent cycle in San Francisco. And I, I'm sure that Mike has loved that article, loves that title. Uh, I think when he came on your guys' podcast, though, he claimed to think that that billboard was actually positive. (laughs) I think that, so yeah, we did have Mike Schmidt on the show recently. Uh, He told us the story about how much of a kick he got out of pointing out that billboard to cab drivers and saying they're like, hey, look, that's me up there, (laughs) which... I mean, at least he has a sense of humor about it, you know? (laughs) It looks so positive. If you haven't seen the billboard, it's got like this giant exclamation point. So Mm -hmm. it's like, and him smiling. So it's a nice photo of him. So it kind of looks like Portland's a Smith show. Like (laughs) if you didn't, if you didn't read it, you'd think like, wow, like big thumbs up, man. Like, yeah, it almost has like this carnival ride energy to it. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Well, well, as this race heats up, Zane, what are you keeping an eye on? Like, what are you really going to be watching to sort of see the curves as uh, the Schmidt versus Vasquez race really gets into high gear? I mean, I think that this is definitely going to be a race where money plays a factor. Uh, We know that those billboards that have gone up repeatedly uh, dinging Mike Schmidt uh, have been paid for by people for Portland. That's the anonymous quote unquote, mostly anonymously funded group. I mean, it's said to be the voice of the city's power brokers and you don't necessarily know who's paying for it. Nathan Vasquez is also out raising Mike in just the public campaign contributions we can see. Uh, I think I just checked it this morning. Uh, Nathan has raised total about 2,000, 215,000. Mike's uh, somewhere like 115. Nathan's already spent like 85,000, which means this, much, this election isn't until May, and Nathan has already spent almost as much as Mike Schmidt has raised, right? It was always sort of obvious, I think, that he was going to get a challenger. I mean, this isn't a surprise. We didn't necessarily know it would be Nathan Vasquez, but he's been getting a lot of pushback for, for basically since he took office. Mm-hmm. And yeah. he didn't start raising money until relatively recently. And for a while, my question was, does he even want it? Does he even want to run for a second term? And now it's very clear he's committed. He does want the job. I mean, it it pays pretty well. It pays, I think, over two hundred thousand dollars a year, and you set <laughs> you set criminal policy for the entire uh, county and for all prosecutions in the county. 
It's like this great Portland tradition of elected leaders not even being clear of whether they want to come back. Like I remember the Ted <laughs> Wheeler before the last election, there are these periods where Ted was like, I don't even know if I like this job anymore. I don't even know if I want to be the mayor. <laughs> and, and it was interesting looking at the campaign contributions because Vasquez is getting some money from Betsy Johnson's political action committee. And Schmidt is getting money from Governor Brown's political action committee. So like sort of echoes of the last gubernatorial election, uh, those lines are still sort of being drawn between the incumbent power seeker and the sort of status quo challenger. We need to have a change. Um, and it's being reflected in the fundraising. I do have a question for the both of you, though, just being relatively new to Portland. I moved here two years ago. In both of your opinions, do you think it's better to be aligned with Kate Brown or with Betsy Johnson with their history? Is there something to say about it or are people just pointing it out? Well, <laughs> I mean, Betsy Johnson did lose the election mm -hmm. for governor. She ran as a third party, so it was uh, very much a quixotic attempt in the in the best light. Um, at the same time, Kate Brown had, I think, polls showing her to be very, very unpopular when she was in office. For better or worse, she became the face of COVID policies and was the first governor in, in modern history that really had a day-to-day -day say in what you could do as a Portlander, right, during 2020 and, and 20, 2021, it was Kate Brown who's saying, you can go to the bars, you can't go to the bars, you can go to the gym, but you have to wear a mask. And mm. that made a lot of people upset. And she never recovered from that. I think that's actually kind of a profound question, Julia, like you <laughs> asked. And it's like, is it better to be aligned with Betsy Johnson or Kate Brown in today's political moment? And it's like, I don't know, but like there definitely is a clear difference to me in that, that like the person who is online with sort of the Kate Brown status quo, uh, you know, rah, rah, sort of organization of government versus the Betsy Johnson outsider, like let's sort of muck it up sort of thing. I think the, the only thing I would say is that despite the fact that this election will ultimately not probably be decided on strategic positioning. I think mm -hmm. both sides are really passionate. Um, Mike Schmidt supporters are the people who feel that our criminal justice system has incarcerated way too many people who feel like the system is racist um, or, and has been for a long time. And I think that in general, Nathan Vasquez supporters are going to be the people who feel like the city doesn't work for them and that they want to go downtown to Powell's with their, their mom or their three-year-old and then they get scared or they feel unsafe because they see something that just makes them feel, you know, like they don't live in a nice place anymore. And so I hope that doesn't get lost, that there are real issues here at play. And I hope that it doesn't just get down to the vibes. Yeah. And like in a certain sense, I think both of those things can kind of be true simultaneously. Like, yes, there is sort of this historic uh, injustice in the way that a lot of policing has been applied over the years. And also it like sucks to live in a city that doesn't feel safe. Well, thank you, Zane. Looking forward to seeing this as it unfurls. Uh, Julia, what do you have your eye on this week? My headline comes from Jonathan Bach at the Portland Business Journal. And he's talking about how there was recently a 30-story affordable housing unit proposal in downtown. And the location would be on the west end of the Burnside Bridge. And it would re replace this empty lot as it stands currently. But uh, what's interesting about it is that it would be one of Portland's largest affordable housing developments, standing at 728 units. Um, right now, the only other largest single building affordable housing development is 240 units. So that gives you um, a sense of what the comparison would be in quite a difference. Um, and the person who's behind it, his name is Curtis Rystan. He's a fourth generation Portland builder. Um, and he says he just wants to help with the housing crisis. But uh, right away, there's already been some complications. City Hall is saying that the building is just way too tall for the area due to zoning codes. Um, the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability said that it's a historic preservation zone, which makes it so that new buildings cannot be built so high. The limit is actually in that area only 75 feet high or six to seven stories. The problem also lies with its proximity to the river. Uh, there are certain height restrictions due to the, the views that they're trying to maintain and also just the way that sunlight uh, comes into the city. But um, that being said, 750 feet or 30 stories is much, much taller than that uh, zoning code limit. But I want to open the floor to you guys to hear your, your initial thoughts. Build it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think this will ever happen in 10 bajillion years the way it's been proposed. I think this guy probably went on one of those AI sites and said, make me a rendering of a building. And that's about as far <laughs> as he's actually gotten. 
but I, I honestly think all the reasons, all the reasons why it can't be done, and it's, is well, the, the code doesn't allow that. It's, it's all inane. If he could actually find the funding, the capital stack for this, then let this man build a giant <laughs> amount of housing. Because if you think about that West End bridgehead, on one side there's yeah, like vacant warehouse and an empty lot and like parking lots. And on the other side, there's hundreds of people lining up for Union Gospel Mission. Yeah, it's so interesting because I feel like when developments get denied is because of the people in the immediate neighborhood, right? Like, I don't want to have a skyscraper right next to my house. I don't want to be having someone looking into my second story bedroom. But like, Mm -hmm. looking on the map at where this is, if it is a 30-story tower, it's not those people that are probably right in the immediate neighborhood. It's, you know, the people who are living six blocks to the west that are going to have their view of the river obscured Mm -hmm. by this thing because it's pretty close to the river. Um, Yeah, I mean, it's so frustrating that we have this housing crisis and that, you know, like, I like zoning. I don't think zoning is a bad idea. I think that, like, it's important for there to be rules about what you can build where. But this is one of them that's just, like, so dumb that, you know, we can't have a building higher than 30 stories. But there are other 30 plus story buildings being built in the city right now. Like the Ritz Carlton tower is being built and it's 35 stories. And like, (laughs) yeah. And and big pink as it stands is 42 stories tall. It's just because of the specific uh, block that they're in that they were even allowed to do that to begin with. And I, you know, you mentioned um, stepping down to the river, right? The fact that we generally have shorter buildings when you get closer to the river. I, I personally, um, think that makes no sense. I, I work yeah. in the Oregonian, right? So I'm at first in clay. I look out at that river place development. If you think at the very uh, southern edge of Tom McCall Waterfront Park, where it turns into that little sort of uh, pedestrian street zone and you can walk and there's all those little businesses facing out and they've got little like two-story houses above. Why do they only have two stories of housing above pedestrian-free streets right on the water in the heart of the city? Those could yeah. be 20 stories, and I don't think you would, anyone would really care. It would still be a vibrant neighborhood. The Mm -hmm. new courthouse building, which is right on the first block before the river, is 17 stories. So, Mm -hmm. I I mean, I I guess people in the West Hills have appreciated this stepping down policy, but I'm not sure who else it benefits. And I will say, there is a little bit of hope that Curtis could pull this off because back in 2018, when um, city council was focusing on the Central City 2035 plan, they were looking to address zoning and transportation policies from Goose Hollow to the central east side and from the Fremont Bridge to the south waterfront. And they actually voted to raise the height restrictions on some blocks within historic areas downtown due to housing concerns. So they were able to find success in that. So it's not unheard of. It, it could be possible in this context as well because it's been done before. Based. And <laughs> it's just like, uh, there there could be so much more housing in downtown. Yeah. One of the last things Curtis said with, in an interview with KGW was that um, you're speaking directly to politicians and you said, if you want to address the housing crisis, put up or shut up. So it sounds <laughs> like he's pretty serious. <laughs> so we'll have to see where this goes. You know, whenever a developer sort of comes across my radar who I've never heard of, I'm always sort of curious. I'm like, who is this guy? Like, what, 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 what's, what's going on with this Curtis fella? So I did some uh, very deep research, a.k.a. Googling. Oh, no. And found that he is also an amateur poker player mm. and is the subject of a 2014 article that says, here's the headline, annoying guy in WSOP main event is every poker player's (laughs) nightmare. (laughs) And it goes on to say, poker pro Kyle Carradine had this happen to him with 10 million on the line. Oh no. He was cruising as one of the chip leaders on day five of the World Series of Poker main event until he was moved to the ESPN featured table where he and seven others encountered amateur Rystad. This oh, Rystad no. guy badly needed a mute button. Sure, he was having a good time at this table, but to everyone around him and anyone watching on TV, he was absolutely insufferable. <laughs> Which, like, poker, you know, sort of like a game of psyche, I can completely see this as just a strategy to psych out your other players at the table. And unfortunately, in the article, I found the links to the videos were actually dead. So if anybody, if anybody out there listening has the links to these World Series of Poker <laughs> clips from 2014, we are deeply interested Please. in CityCast Port. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's take a quick break. And then when we come back, more news of the week.
This episode is brought to you by Certified Piedmontese Beef. Listen up, foodies. Make your next meal even better with real Nebraska beef. They have healthy, tender, delicious Italian heritage beef, grass-fed and sustainably raised on lush pastures in the Midwest. You can even create your own personally curated meat box that's shipped right to your door. To get two free steaks with any purchase over $50, use the code FREEBEEF at checkout. Learn more and shop exclusively at cpbeef.com. All right, so the story that I'm looking at is actually something that came out last week, but uh, I think it's worth talking about, and it's good news. I feel like we often yes. sort of are in the infuriating news zone, but uh, moves are being made to make outdoor dining program permanent in the city. Uh, we sort of got going with this during the pandemic. A bunch of restaurants were like, ah, I can't serve food and I'm going to go out of business. So the city put in all these sort of temporary rules to allow all of these outdoor dining structures to come online. And it has sort of always been like, there's a provisional thing. We're going to give you a one-year permit. We're just sort of doing this for now. And the city has come around to deciding that this is something that we want to have going in perpetuity. So uh, it was presented to city council last week by Commissioner Mingus Maps, um, And it sort of just builds out some of the rules of what would be needed in order to make this permanent. It still needs to be like officially adopted, but it's, you know, as far as I'm hearing, there isn't any organized opposition to it. So it's probably going to probably going to happen. We'll be able to eat snacks outside year round, <laughs> Yay. forever. Yay! <laughs> so, what are some of these rules that are um, going to change the actual permit? Well, they, you know, of course, since it's the city, they issued a sixty-page report, um, <laughs> and like, you know, it's it's actually, from my read of it, nothing super crazy. Um, they did point out that there's just like a, like a lot of um, accessibility questions in some of these structures. Um, which totally makes sense. I've definitely seen places that just sort of built a two by four platform and it doesn't have accessibility. So that's going to be a, a a thing that people are going to need to retrofit. Um, they also need to make sure that they're not creating hazards for people on the sidewalk to sort of preserve pedestrian access. And then there's sort of just like a question of like permanent permitting, right? Mm. Um, so they're going to start building in this program permits, you know, and building up a fee structure. Um, it was completely free for a while for restaurants. Um, in 2022, they changed it to an annual $150 fee. And they haven't actually like set what the fees are going to be for businesses. That's going to be taken up by city council next month. John, I think that you're so right. This is like a huge win for the city's small business owners. I haven't mm -hmm. heard any opposition from anyone. And this is something that's taking away parking. So you would expect to hear, and I'm sure there are some people out there who don't like that. But I think by and large, the city's uh, you know, restaurateurs, and that's not how you say that word, but I'm going to go with it. The restaurant <laughs> owners. <laughs> the, the, the French restaurant too, this is Portland. <laughs> <laughs> We, we use that word in the newspaper. <laughs> I, I don't even know how to spell it. <laughs> the restaurant owners love this because they get to double their space. I think that these have become magical spaces, really. Like, think about, like, the Clinton Triangle or yeah, on Harvey yeah. Milk Street mm -hmm. uh, downtown. It's somewhere where you can go and just sit in this reclaimed area that has, you know, in the best places, uh, lots of seating, it's covered, planters, heat lamps, uh, string lighting. I mean, these are some awesome places. Uh, there are so many um, spots that I've been to in the city now where you can't even imagine going out to eat without that restaurant shed. And the idea that we would roll that back just because the pandemic, quote unquote, ended is crazy. I mean, I'm so glad the city is working to make this permanent. Yeah, it's one of the reasons why I fell in love with the area that I currently live in, in Kearns. That 28th strip is full of restaurants that have that outdoor seating. And it's just so inviting every time, even if you're not going out to eat, if you're running an errand to walk through there, it feels very uh, cozy and community oriented. Um, but I'm wondering, John, if there's any sort of attention um, put towards making sure that these restaurants can still afford the permit as it gets to be more permanent and um, maybe less affordable because you, you mentioned that this process or this program started out as free. That is a concern, and we don't entirely know. Um, they haven't said what the new fee schedule is going to be. Um, that's going to be taken up next month, mm -hmm. and I think that 
you know, if they make this permanent, but then say that it's like $5,000 a year per restaurant, I think that city council is wise enough to know that they're going to get a lot of blowback. Um, and they are working on um, some plans to subsidize the fees for both the 2024 permitting cycle to sort of ease people into it. And they say that they're creating um, an assistance program to help quote, meet the needs of both new and legacy installations. Mm. Um, You know, there was some talk in the report specifically about BIPOC-owned restaurants and, like, support that they might need in the city. Um, I'm not reading anything super clear about what that program is going to look like, but it does sound like they're at least thinking about it. You mentioned um, accessibility, too, and I I actually was in um, a spot recently and i there was someone there a wheelchair user right and it was obvious that this was someone who you know comes comes regularly was talking to all the other people there and in the outdoor dining shed and they actually that i was eavesdropping and the person said you know is this accessible and the guy in the wheelchair responded like no i can only sit right here but at the same time i could tell that there was a huge sense of community in that dining shed and those these people who were stopping for a beer after work and Mm -hmm. The fact that that space can exist, even if it's not perfect, is an offer community. I mean, that's not necessarily good enough, but you would hate to destroy that sense of community because it's not perfect, right? If we need to help improve people, the accessibility in these things, I hope the city will pay for it Mm -hmm. um, and and give out grants for it rather than making the entirely be a burden of uh, the restaurant operators. Well, yeah, for for businesses out there that are interested in this... um, the permitting application is set to open in October, uh, middle of October, and then the permitting cycle is going to start in January. So this is coming. Uh, yay, outdoor dining all winter long, all summer long, all forever long. Yeah. <laughs> Rainy dining. <laughs> Which like, hey, man, I'm good for it. <laughs> well, we're hardy. <laughs> people are going to go use it. Uh, you know that those people, those vape users honking on uh, a vape or a cigarette are going to love those spaces. You just called out so many people there, Zane. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> who among us? <laughs> half our listeners are like, huh? And the other half are like, hey. <laughs> I mean, they can't see us, but we all have three lemon bars a piece right now, or elf bars, right? We're all just uh, yeah. You know. just, oh, get get with the lingo. <laughs> oh, yeah. hey, it's elf. <laughs> Not cool. Uh, well, let's let's talk about one uh, good thing that sort of caught our attention this week. To wrap it up, Zane, while you're puffing on your elf bar, uh, <laughs> what's <laughs> what's something? Good I am. I gotta have it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Let's see, as someone who only covers bad news on the criminal justice beat, what have I been excited to see? Come, come back to me. I'm thinking. I will. I will take the first hit as, uh, <laughs> as Zane scrambles to come up with a piece of good news. Um, not even news. I just want to talk about tomatoes. It is tomato season, and <laughs> I've had so many killer tomatoes in the past week. I've been making BLTs. I made a penzanella. It is just like. Get your butt to the farmer's market this weekend, buy some tomatoes, eat them with your whole face. It is like (laughs) this beautiful thing that we only get for like a couple weeks out of the year. And like now is the time to do it. Mine's food related too, John. Um, This one's pretty personal, but I spent last night on the phone, or I guess on FaceTime with my nonna, who's Mm. out in Toronto. And we went step by step cooking one of her favorite meals, which is like this rustic rapini and anchovy pasta. And it was my favorite thing. And I would say if you if you have a grandma, give her a call. This is your sign to give a give a call to your grandma and say hello. Oh, I love that, Julia. See, Zane, good things aren't hard. Oh, I, well, uh, this wasn't, this was, this was over the weekend, right? But I went to Helium Comedy Club's annual stand up comedy festival where they oh, elect Portland's God. funniest person. Uh-huh. And it was hilarious. Um, it was all dudes this year. It was just dudes. Oops, just dudes. Um, <laughs> but that's never oops. happened before. Wait a minute. <laughs> but the Portland Mercury's article uh, ran the headline self described. Quote, Gen Z piece of shit, Cameron Peloso <laughs> won Helium's annual stand-up comedy contest. And if that's not good news, <laughs> the TikTok generation, they're here and they're coming for us. Oh, man. <laughs> oh, my gosh. That's so good. <laughs> yeah. So that was a great, great time. And I would totally encourage everyone out there, if you've never seen local comedy in Portland, uh, it's actually good. I, well, uh, Zane, Julia, this has been fun. Thank you so much. Thanks, John. Thank you. 
Well, that's all for us today here on CityCast Portland. Thank you so much for listening. If you've enjoyed the show, why not tell a friend about it or leave us a rating or a review? We'd really appreciate it. Our audio producers this week are Julia Fiaioni and AKL Mutmed. Our newsletter editors are Rachel Monahan and Adrian Gonzalez. And our host is Claudia Meza. I'm lead producer John Natariani. Original music by Jenny Conley and Stephen Drisos, with additional music by Epidemic Sound and All the Kimonos. We're going to be taking Monday off for the holiday, but we'll be back on Tuesday morning with a lot more from around the city. Until then, see you at Slim's. Mm-hmm.